Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the UConn Hockey Podcast. On today's episode, I'm joined by a very special guest, the captain of the UConn men's hockey team, Hudson Shandord, joins the podcast today. Hudson has 64 points in his UConn hockey career so far and also helped the team to a Hockey East Championship appearance during his sophomore year. Hudson, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and coming on the podcast, and how's everything going? Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Matthew. It's a, it's a real privilege to be on here, and it's going good. It's almost that time again, right? You can kind of feel it in the air. It's getting a little brisk out here on the West Coast, so it's about time to get back in the rink and uh, start going to war with the men again. So it's exciting, exciting to be back at school soon. Yeah, obviously, I know that you head back on Wednesday, so but what's your off season been like uh, this summer, and what, have you done anything interesting, whether it's been hockey-related or not? Yeah, no, uh, it, it's been great. I uh, I work out with this guy, Ryan Kerr, RK4 Development, um, five times a week during the summer, who's been huge in my development kind of as a player, but also as a person too. He trains you to be a really good human and as, as well as a great athlete at the same time. So that's kind of a staple I always look forward to when I come home and you try and mix in some fun too. There's a, there's a beautiful spot about an hour away from here called Whistler. And I'd recommend anyone go and see it it's beautiful it's two massive mountains for skiing bount, mountain biking beautiful lakes to relax by too during the day so had a nice weekend up there a couple of weeks ago and uh yeah but now it's kind of it's that time you start looking forward to season and getting locked in but we had some fun this summer and a lot of hard work too yeah i saw that a bunch of other yukon guys um train with ryan i know that carter berger was with him I think Matthew Wood worked with him a little bit as well. And obviously Connor Bedard, most notably, is also one of his guys. What's it like working with other high-end athletes like some of your teammates and like Bedard uh, during the summer? Does that make you better as well going against those guys in training? Yeah, no, I think you hit the nail on the head. Absolutely, it does. You know, I think the reason that all of us have kind of got to where we are is because of the natural competitiveness that we all have. So I think that does trickle into the gym a little bit and we all push each other pretty strong. But all those guys, though, we do have some competitive moments. They're all really great, humble people. Like I couldn't say enough about the whole group we have in the gym in general is just super stellar all around. You know, they're all guys that I would want on my team or a part of my company and in my foxhole, if you would, uh, instead of in the other one. So it's, it's always fun coming back in the summer and working with those guys. Now, what did your offseason training look like? And what are some things that you wanted to sort of work on for the upcoming season? Uh, yeah, you know, a big thing for me this summer was kind of redefining my stride almost. I think, you know, my, I was missing out on being a little bit more efficient. So I had, uh, I had the opportunity to work with a physiotherapist named Sean Campbell, who is really expertise is in hockey and being efficient skater, not only a powerful one, but efficient at the same time. So I think, you know, I had some time to work with him and Ryan as a team, to allow me to kind of lengthen my stride and get some more power quickly, but also in a more efficient manner. So that was kind of a big focus for me and off the ice, on the ice specifically more. um, It would have to be probably my shot shooting from distance a little bit. I wanted to work on working on angle changing. I know that's so big in today's game um, that just translates so well through every level is kind of being able to shoot through defenders around defenders and, Um, really make the goalie work and see pucks and battle through screens. So those were kind of two big keys for me that I was working with all off season with some unbelievable people around me. Now, one thing I noticed about your game last year was you did a good job sort of playing different roles in the forward group. I know your sophomore year, you primarily were on the wing, but it seemed like during your junior year, you were played more center and had to work on your face-offs and be more two-way player. How did you sort of work on that part of your game during the summer? Yeah. I mean, I think, I'm very fortunate that naturally I can kind of play almost anywhere. I think if you ask kind of most of the coaches that I've played for, whether in juniors or coach Cav, they would say that they would trust me to kind of play either on the wing or down the middle. And I've played both growing up countless times. So I didn't have to make any huge adjustments. Of course, when you get to college, the guys on the dot are a little bit stronger than the guys in juniors. So That's something that we're going to have to work on a little bit more next year too, just to become that really elite two-way centerman that I aspire to be. So um, that's kind of the one key I would say next year is if I can become a really stellar player on the face-off dot, I think that'll just kind of help everything, whether that's, you know, getting possession right right off it or kind of killing another centerman's confidence also that can play a role in face-offs too. So 
we're going to work with that. I know Mike Finnegan did a really good job pre-scouting the centerman last year. So we're going to, uh, we're going to go back with him and hit the drawing board and hopefully we can, as a full group, improve our percentage overall. Do you like uh, ever try to ask your teammates about some of the strategies they do? Cause I know Yakum was really good in the face-off circle. I'm curious if you ever talked to guys like him or some of your current teammates, because I know Samu did a really good job as a freshman in the dot to sort of improve that area of your game. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, that's why you have teammates and guys on your team. You know, if somebody's having a great day on the dot, typically there's a reason behind it. They're doing something that you're not doing. And I know everyone kind of has their own little things that they do on the dot, which is what makes face-offs kind of such a cool part of the game. But yeah, Joachim was great. Actually, he taught me a couple really good moves where, you know, he's like, he was a huge guy, right? <laughs> Six four. He's like, I hate going against guys, little guys like you on the dot because you guys can get way lower and you do these little moves on me. So there was a couple things that, you know, he showed me. I'm not going to put any secrets out there into the world. for this. Oh, subject. please don't. I don't want any <laughs> but, opponents uh, listening to this and getting any ideas. So Yeah, no, but uh, he, Joachim was such a great leader to us, too. He taught us so many things. But face-offs were definitely something that he helped me out on a lot, for sure. Now, you were named one of the team captains back in May. So my question is, what type of leadership do you want to bring to, to the team compared to last season? And would you consider yourself more of a vocal leader or lead-by-example type of player? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's hard to kind of replicate what Roman was able to do for us last year, just being around the program for such a long time and having such a strong veteran presence that he had. I think he did an awesome job kind of for our team, having such a young team around him. He really got us all to kind of buy in right from day one, which is why we started so well. Um, So I'm just going to try and build off of him. You know, I'm a very positive, uplifting person, I'd like to say. And I like to think kids can rely on me if something's not going right. You know, the sun's going to still rise the next morning. I say that all the time. So just kind of bring a lot of positivity to the room, you know, just believing in everyone, having confidence in everyone is kind of what I try to do. I would definitely say I have a vocal aspect to my leadership, but I like to think I also can back it up on the ice as well and lead by example at the same time. So I don't know if there's one specifically out of the two that I do more than the other, but it's kind of a I try and combine both together almost and find that nice combination of not being overly vocal or only relying on your player to do the talking. You'd ever talk to other captains about that. Like does Harrison be more vocal one day and you're sort of the lead by example and it sort of switches up uh, throughout each practice or game. Yeah. I don't know if there's necessarily switches, but I feel like some guys are kind of just naturally um lead by example guys and other guys are more naturally vocal leaders I don't know if we have the quite exact dynamic for our leadership group this year I know we'll be adding another assistant captain kind of come into training camp and see how that plays out which is always interesting and we'll kind of figure it out usually after there it's kind of it's weird how it just naturally kind of happens over the course of the season so we'll see I'm excited I'm super excited to have Flinny and Harry beside me two guys who have obviously been around just like Roman had and yeah, a lot, lot of positivity coming from those guys, too. It'll be really exciting. Now, I'm genuinely curious because I'm not sure what the NCAA rules are like, but when do you guys like actually officially start practicing and sort of what type of drills do you guys work on uh, in September and early October before the season begins? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think you have to have two weeks before you can officially practice as a team where it's like a month out of your season. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that's that's kind of what it is along those lines. Um, typically it's kind of, well, it changes every year, to be honest. The first year I was here, um, we had a kind of a new mix of young and old guys. So we had to relearn a lot of the systems and last year was a full new team almost. Right. So we had to really go back to the drawing board and learn everything from day one, because the way we play is a lot different than a lot of guys have played in the past. So it does take a little bit of time. It does to kind of fully learn and embrace our systems and find the little nuances here and there that really can separate us from other teams. Moving into next year, we have a lot of guys coming back. You know, we have a lot of guys to rely on to coming back and we might be able to move into some more advanced things kind of right away. You know, once the new guys were all great guys and seemed like very intelligent hockey players can catch up and, tag right along that might be able to help us a lot down the line, kind of being able to work on some more advanced things right away. Now, what are your team's goals and expectations for next season? I assume it's to finally make your first uh, NCAA appearance. And are there things that you guys did well last season that you sort of want to build on this year? And are there things that you believe you guys really need to improve on for next season when you sort of think about last year and some of the things your team did well and did not do well? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that goal is always in mind. You know, you, you want to go to that tournament. And I think we've been very unlucky the last two years to not get in. You know, we've been so close both times, which is really frustrating. So I think everyone who's been on the team during these last two years kind of just has that in the back of their mind all the time, all summer that, you know, we want to go to the dance. Like, let's see, let's get there and see what happens. You know, we just saw what Quinnipiac did. We had a great game with them, you know, arguably should have won like close, super close either way game. They had a great, unbelievable team, but it's like, we're right there. You know, we can play with those guys. So that's definitely a goal and not only to get there, but to succeed at the tournament and win at the tournament, because I know we can, I've seen, you know, we played teams that succeed and win at this tournament and teams that we've beaten or been right there with the entire time. So it's definitely not only get to the tournament, but have success in the tournament is kind of what's going through a lot of our minds right now in terms of building off of things from last year. I think during that second half of the year, we really started to kind of move into some more advanced offensive zone kind of mechanics as a team. And I think it really benefited us kind of down the stretch. We were able to put up some big goal numbers kind of just through these little nuances that were getting taught to us kind of in February and January, which we didn't really have at the start of the year. So kind of those definitely helped. And, you know, we got to keep whatever we did exactly <laughs> and uh, keep moving on with that. And, um, you know, I think when we had really good success as a team here, it does come from our defense. I, it, it does. You know, we play – a really tough D zone to play against that can be smothering and swarming at times. And I think a lot of our offense actually gets generated from that. So really getting back to that and make sure everyone's on the same page about playing defense hard in the right way, I think will help elevate everything in our game. Yeah. And um, I just sort of want to follow up a little bit more on that. Was there some things in the second half that you think your team needs to get better at? Because at least from my perspective, it felt like there were games like, for example, you guys lost a really tough overtime game against New Hampshire where it was very back and forth. But then the next game when you played against them, you blew them out. I'm curious if you sort of look at certain games like that and sort of like maybe we can improve on this sort of thing so we can be a little more consistent, especially in the second half of the season. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think. You know, also UNH was a great team down the stretch. That second half of last year, I think, you know, if you take out their first half, they were one of the top three teams in Hockey East in terms of records down the stretch. So, you know, I don't know if we were quite as prepared as we should have been for that team. You know, every time you go up to UNH, they're going to give you a hard game. You know, once they shrunk that ice down, they have a great fan base behind them. They always come to play there. So I think with such a young team, we maybe weren't as ready as we needed to be for that game. Um, but definitely when you look at, you know, how can you go from that to winning? I can't remember what the score was, but it was put up a huge number of six goals. to one. <laughs> yeah. Six to one. I think that game was kind of, you know, coach Cav always says offense is like cats, you know, you, you call for them and you don't know, they might, they might come, they might not, but defense is dogs. You know, when you're, your dog will always come, you know, when it comes. So it's, I think relying on that defense, like I said earlier, and making sure that that's there every single night, because you can't necessarily control everything in a game, right? We play on an ice sheet with a little rubber, you know, puck. Like this thing is, you know, it's impossible to control everything offensively, but you can control a lot defensively in terms of work ethic, positioning, and all of that. So I think really leaning on that this year is going to be a key for us. Yeah, I always love a good Coach Cab metaphor. He always has one in each press always, conference. So. <laughs> always does, yeah. What's it like playing in hockey? It's just the competition that you face each game, especially coming into this season, because I'm assuming you sort of look at each team, and I think there's like seven or eight teams that have a good chance at making the national tournament if you really look at it. It's a very, very wide range of teams that could really do a lot of good things this upcoming season. How excited are you to play in hockey East again this season and What's sort of it like, what's it like sort of playing those high end teams and players each weekend? Yeah, it's special. You know, I think even though we've been so close to the tournament, I think part of the reason is hockey East teams just tend to knock each other out. You know, we're all, it's hard to sweep a weekend in this league, right? A lot of really high end teams or high end players on every single team across the entire league. And I know a lot of my friends back home, they're all watching the NHL draft and they see all these guys going to BU, BC. They're like, wow, the, the league's going to be crazy next year. And I'm like, it's been crazy, man. <laughs> it's good every year. So, you know, it's obviously exciting to have a lot of talent um, in the league for next year. 
Yeah, like you just said, there's a lot of teams that are going to be really good. I think this might be one of the deeper, deeper years that I've seen since I've been here, to be honest. But that just excites me, to be honest with you. You know, to get the opportunity to play against all of these teams every weekend and have a chance to go against the best and beat the best is something that I've always wanted personally. And I know that it's something our team wants. So I think it's something we're all really looking forward to. And uh, yeah, it's going to be an exciting year for sure. Are there any games in particular that you're sort of looking forward to next season that like, I know the schedule came out. I'm assuming there's some games you circle um, on the calendar. Yeah. I mean, not as much as last year. I think last year we had so many crazy yeah. games in marquee stadiums and facilities, especially with the Toscano just opening up to where this year, I think, you know, it might help actually just to kind of take out those distraction games that we had circled on our calendars even though someone might not say they did, it was just, it's in human nature not to have those big games circled. So to kind of take those on out of the equation, I think it might actually help us just focus on the day-to-day of every week, just getting better over the course of the entire season to find our best in the playoff times, instead of trying to find our best in December for MSG or January for Fenway, and instead just really trusting the process throughout the entire season um, to get to the goal that we want. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I feel like as a fan, you always circle on answers. I guess you can do that a little bit since you're not playing in the games. I'm, I feel like I'm looking forward to the BU or BC games because I feel like oh. those are always very competitive. Yeah. And I'm excited to see, you know, you guys go up against some of those uh, top draft picks. That Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that those games will be fun, I'm sure. You know, that they always have great teams anyways, both BU and BC. But to add the talent that, you know, they did – it's going to be a, yeah, it's, those games are definitely going to be fun for sure. Now, have you had the chance to sort of meet any of the new guys um, on the team yet? And how do you plan on building a connection with them both on and off the ice, especially since some of them might be your future line mates? I know Torvberg signed uh, his pro contract uh, last season. You guys really worked well together. So I'm assuming you're going to have to have a new line mate. So how do you sort of build that chemistry with the new players? And have you had the chance to meet any of them? I know they haven't officially been announced, but Obviously, I think there's a lot of speculation that's true about who those new players will be. Yeah, absolutely. No, I've got a chance to meet um, all of them, I believe. And they're all great, really great guys. You know, I had a chance to go back in the summer and meet them for a a week and a half. And they all seem like really sharp kids and kids that are going to help our team a lot. You know, when when guys come in here, I think it can be a little bit nerve wracking. At least it was for me about how can I produce right away? What can I do right away? And it's maybe not much about that as I thought it was. It's about kind of accepting the process of where you are right now and where you are going to be in four years and don't get caught up necessarily on your results in the first couple of weeks as a young guy. It's those are going to come over time. You know, these guys are all great players that are going to get results in this league. And I think just accepting kind of the process side of it of the start is so huge for them. And um in terms of building chemistry with line mates, I mean, Coach Cab always does a good job kind of bringing lines in and explaining kind of roles to them in a way. And I think that's something we should continue to do as a team as well. And, you know, I kind of I kind of view line mates kind of very similar to everyone else on the team. You know, I I'm just trying to be super positive. You know, I can't we can't expect as a line to go out and be perfect every single shift. So when guys on my line are getting frustrated, even for the course of a period, if we don't have a great period, it's okay, we're fine. Let's brush that off onto the next shift. You know, we don't have time in hockey to sit there and dwell and get upset because that's when you can start stringing those bad shifts together, right? It's okay, let's flush it, move on to the next shift. That doesn't go well, that's fine. Do the same thing. Let's learn, learn from what we could do better. Absolutely is a huge part of it. But once we have that main message, cut it, flush it, and let's move on to the next shift. Let's transition now and talk about the beginning of your hockey career and sort of go back down memory lane with your time with UConn so far. So you're from Vancouver. Talk about growing up there and how'd you start playing hockey? Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know if it's just the religion of Canada in general, but I think I was on skates about as soon as I could walk from what my parents tell me. So um, yeah, kind of just started playing hockey all the time. My parents have some funny videos of me kind of waddling as a baby, listening to the national anthem at Canucks games and just kind of dreaming about ending up as a professional hockey player at some point. So since then I moved on, played at North Rand Minor for one year, then the North Shore Winter Club, which is a very prestigious hockey club and was very fortunate to spend the majority of my minor hockey days there. 
before transitioning into major midget and then the BCHL eventually, which is another great league that just happens to be right by my home. So I think I was very blessed and fortunate to play where I was, but to also play in an area that's so competitive in this hockey world where everyone is really pushing each other here all the time, just because of the top tier talent that continues to come out of here. Who was your favorite player growing up? I assume it was probably a Canuck. Yeah. I it's a, it's a hard one. You know, the hardest part is I want to say I love Jonathan Taves, but I just couldn't stand the Blackhawks when I was growing up because they kept knocking us out of the playoffs. But I think, you know, when you look at the Sedins and the way that they played the game, it's unlike anything that anyone's really ever seen. You know, their ability to just possess and hold on to pucks and tire out defenders and then score on them when they're tired was just so mechanical it was almost robotic what they were able to do and you know kind of picking up little things about just putting pucks in the right areas for their literal brother is was so cool the way they were able to have such amazing chemistry and intelligence on the ice you know they weren't the biggest guys they weren't the fastest guys didn't have the best shot but they were just so intelligent within the game had such special hockey iq and chemistry i think those two are just yeah outstanding players and people I got to ask you this. You played college in New England. I know a lot of your teammates are Bruins fans. Obviously, you know how big the Bruins and Canucks rivalry was back in the day. What is the chirping like between you and some of your teammates regarding that? Because I know it has to be brought up sometimes. Oh, yeah. It might be brought up <laughs> a little bit too much, to be honest, <laughs> my liking. But uh, no, we actually went to uh, Canucks Bruins game. I think it was two years ago. A bunch of us, a mix of the Canadians from the West Coast and a bunch of the Boston guys went down to and had a had a lot of fun, but um, yeah, no, the tripping is definitely there and it's definitely just salt in the wound that's been there for the past <laughs> 12 years anyways. But yeah, it was, it was, it was a tragic loss for the, for the Canucks that night, but you know, hopefully we'll make it back one day. Well, me and you are probably the same age. I, I assume you're probably a little bit older than I am. And I did not like those Canucks team at, at all. I remember when Burroughs bit Bergeron's finger, oh. I could stand them. And my dad took yeah. me to the game the year after the Bruins won the cup when that huge brawl took place in Marchand, uh, Lowbridge, Sammy Salo. And yeah. it was one of the craziest games ever. And I just remember like despising the Canucks after that just because they were always trying to beat up the Bruins and stuff. And it was such a fun rivalry. And I feel like you're never going to, see that today in the NHL just because there's it's not as physical as it used to be, but those games yeah, were so no. much fun to watch. Yeah, you're right. No, man, that playoff series, when you look back on it and, you know, we always, it's actually funny. We always watch end up watching highlights of the, of that playoff series. They always somehow come on between, <laughs> you know, all of us somehow. And of course they come on, right? Like at the end. But some of the things that went down in that series where it was the Aaron Rome hit yeah. or Nathan Horn or the Mason Raymond injury in the corner, Tim Thomas, Cross check, cross checking Henrik Sedin <laughs> in front of the net. It was absolutely bizarre when you look back on it, but we were just so caught up in the moment that everyone just thought that was the new normal. So, you know, I wish that we could have a Stanley Cup series like that again because I think that's one of the best ones of all time for sure. It's probably my favorite one. Obviously, I'm a bit biased as a Bruins fan, but the yeah. best Stanley Cup series uh, in the last like 20 years, I would have to imagine, because the ones I've seen recently have been sort of like five or four game sweeps. Yeah, no, you're you're right. That one, there was there was just something different about it too, about the West Coast versus East Coast. Like it mm -hmm. was that one just ran way too deep. Canucks were looking for their first cup, and I think there was just so much energy, kind of throughout both teams on both sides that it just created one of the most beautiful hockey series of all time. Now, before UConn, like you mentioned, you played in the BCHL for the Salmon Arm Silverbacks. That's a great name. And the Surrey Eagles. Uh, talk about your experience in the BCHL and how it's sort of helped prepare you for college hockey. And do you sort of have like a favorite memory in that league when you sort of look back on it today? Yeah. I mean, I played in Salmon Arm, to be honest. I didn't think I was going to make the team the rookie year I ended up playing. Um, but, you know, kind of had a great camp. And the coaches, they had a brand-new coaching staff that came in, and they really liked me and liked my game and brought me on kind of just as a younger guy. And they're like, you might not play every night at the start, but we really like where you could be by the end of the year. And I said, okay, yeah, I can do that. It was my last year of high school, so – I don't know if you know anything about Salmon Arm, but I don't think there's more than 16,000 people in the town. It's a very small town where the Silverbacks are kind of at the center of it. And that was really cool. It was cool to experience that, to kind of be, you know, 
a huge part of this community and have a community like that really embrace you with tremendous billet families and a great organization was really cool. And, you know, it was unfortunate that I ended up getting traded from there, but you know, that's business hockey's a business kind of thing now. So I ended up getting moved from there. Appreciate my time. The coaches teammates were unbelievable. You know, I'm friends for life from there still today. Then I ended up getting traded to Surrey my 19 year old year when I was still uncommitted. I had a couple of talks with other universities, but nothing super serious at the time. And Surrey the year before, I think had six wins in 63 games, if I'm not mistaken. It really was not, it wasn't a pretty team. You know, they were not good. They cleaned house completely, brand new coaching staff. They only had, I think it was, two, I'm trying to think, I think it was one or two kids left and it was a full new team after that. So we kind of came in, you know, the culture was still lingering a little bit and it was a lot of uncertainty just because of the year before and everything that happened, kind of full cleaning house that off season. No one was really sure how good we were going to be. You know, everyone obviously has aspirations, but, you know, we didn't know. And, you know, we didn't have a great start to the season at all. I think we were last in our division right before Christmas. And, you know, I remember just being really down in the dumps. You know, I didn't have a commitment at the time. And I was just like, damn, this, this isn't good. Like this, this sucks right now. And they ended up making a trade, trading away our captain at the time, Cody Siobhan, um, who's unbelievable, one of my favorite captains I've had, great guy. Um, but we just needed a change up, you know, right? It's when something's not going like that, they needed a switch up for something to either to bring some energy or do anything. So we traded away Cody and Cam, Cam Keith, our coach, one of my favorite coaches of all time, you know, unbelievable. If anyone ever has the opportunity to go play for coach Keith in Surrey, I'd recommend it in a heartbeat for this reason. He brought in Christophe Tellier, who's on Quinnipiac, who's my line mate at the time. And he brought in him and I into his office. And, you know, he said, how do you're going to be the captain of this team? And, you know, tells you're going to be his, you know, you're going to continue to be an assistant, but it's like a one, a one B thing, which is how we're going to do this. And he said, this is going to be your guys' team now. I'm here to have your guys back, whatever you guys say or want to do. I'm open to all ideas, whatever you guys think in terms of systems, mentality, pregame speeches, warm-ups, everything. But I want you guys to take accountability for this team and really try and lead us to the promised land. I think I remember looking at Tellier kind of like, what? <laughs> it's like, can we do this at 19? We're going to run a full team of guys right now? And... That's exactly what we did, man. It was really cool, the kind of the way that we were able to grasp kind of the minds and the mentality of everyone in the team, just I think from caring about them and being positive with them that they did the same thing. And it's like, we're going to work for you. Cool. I'm going to reciprocate that right back. And it was so cool and almost contagious how it just spread around the room of everyone was taking accountability for each other's actions and then we just had this most genuine great coach I've ever had, Cam Keith, there to support us all out right behind. And I think we were last in the division at December and ended up getting to, I can't remember if it was, I think we got into third right before playoff time and then ended up beating the Chilliwack Chiefs in a playoff series right before COVID hit. A team absolutely loaded with commitments and draft picks. I know Nikita Nestorenko kind of headlined that team, who's obviously a great player at BC for a couple of years. Cooper Moore, who was an unbelievable defenseman. I believe he's going to Quinnipiac this year. They had Karan, who's going to Boston University as their goalie. So if you kind of look at our team, it was almost like a team full of misfits is kind of how I would describe it, that we're paying pick from everywhere. And the way we were able to come together behind Cam and just through really positive leadership and uplifting everyone at the same time was so cool. Now talk about your recruiting process with UConn and what sort of made you want to go there versus the schools you might have looked at. Because like you were mentioning, you sort of had to deal with a lot of challenges during your junior career. So how did they sort of find you and um, how did it sort of how did that sort of connection happen between you and I'm assuming Joe Pereira because he was the one that recruited out there? Yeah, um, I, I think it was actually Heltz was my first conversation uh, with UConn was was with uh, Coach Heltz. But um yeah, it was actually kind of just crazy. I think this is, you know, it's actually kind of funny. I think it's just work out, right? It's the only hat trick of my junior career happened at the game where 
I believe it was health that was there, right? My only hat trick in my junior career. And, you know, he talked to me after the game saying, you know, we really like you. We'd love to have you out on campus sometime soon. And at the time I was, I had a couple of conversations with other schools before that, where I knew things were kind of starting to heat up a little bit, kind of down the stretch, the second half of my uh, year in Surrey, when we were starting to play really well, uh, teams were kind of starting to come. And I was like, okay, this could happen pretty fast because, you know, it's my 19 year old year. If I want to leave next year, teams are going to want, you know, stuff done really soon. So right after that, um, we organized a trip with UConn super quick. And at the time, Carter Berger, who lives five minutes away from me, was at the school. So I think, you know, having him there as someone that I could kind of rely on who had been there before was super crucial in the recruiting process. And I know that helped my, make my decision a lot easier, but it was kind of just a feeling, man. When I got on campus, drove through it the first time with Alex, I'm looking around like, yeah, like I could see myself here. You know, it's a really cool campus. You know, at the time, obviously they were starting to talk about building a new rink too, the Toscano. I think JP might have lied to a few of us saying it was going to be ready our sophomore year, but we'll, <laughs> let, we'll let us slide with that one. We got it for our junior year, so that's okay. But no, there was a lot of excitement about it being a new up and coming program too, which is, you know, something that I just experienced in Surrey the year before, right? Kind of turning a team around and getting it to that next level. So having this same idea and thought process about trying to take a team to that next level was something that really stood out to me and something that I'm so glad that I ended up taking up on. Now, what was like sort of the biggest adjustment you had to make to college hockey as a freshman? Uh, that's a great question. I would say, you know, it's a lot more of a physical game than in the BCHL. BCHL does play. There's a lot of really good defenders that come out of that league, but there's a lot of offense that gets played in that league as well. And I think coming to college where every game has so much on the line, defense tends to just kind of amp up a little bit all over. So the physicality side of it was definitely a bit of an adjustment, but I also think that kind of has helped my game over three years too. kind of learning how to deal with taking little bumps here and there and almost using them to your advantage has been something that's actually been able to help me. Especially at Freitas the first year, because the smaller ice surface, I feel like it was more physical. I'm assuming, do you remember the Kale Howarth hit? against BU oh, where he like lit that yeah. guy up. I know he got suspended for it, but that was one of the biggest hits I've ever seen. Yeah, there was that one and there was Adam Karashek absolutely destroyed <laughs> the UMass. Although I was angling him up the up the wall on the left and then all of a sudden it's just like a blur that goes right by <laughs> me. And I'm just like, what just happened? <laughs> and yeah, he, uh, yeah, Schick's had some huge hits for us that year, actually. That was, uh, yeah, the Frida's definitely played into the our physical brand that year for sure yeah adam could eat pucks for days it feels like i think he had like almost like 40 block shots that season or something oh, like that i wouldn't have been surprised <laughs> it's kind of that he's just like a puck magnet kind of is what we call it. they just kind of seem to find him all over him and ryan wheeler shout out ryan wheeler he's another puck magnet he gets them in practice though which is tough those are yeah tough. yeah <laughs> Talk a little about your freshman year. Obviously, it was the pandemic year where you guys played all your home games at Freitas with no fans, but sort of how did you handle the challenge of dealing with all the restrictions that year? Because obviously, you guys didn't know who you were going to play until like that Tuesday of that week. And then you guys had a really tough playoff game against Providence where you got blew, blew out. And I'm sort of curious if you sort of used that game as motivation uh, for your sophomore year, because it seemed like that was the case, the way you guys sort of uh, went through that season. But just yeah. talk a little about your freshman year and sort of what you took away from that season. Yeah, I mean, that was a bit of a weird year just because of everything that was going on. But I think having such a great group of guys kind of in the locker room where we could rely on each other was so important, right? Like I just mentioned, Karashek, you know, Zach Robbins, Brian Regali, Wheels, you know, just such an unbelievable, Kale Howarth, unbelievable group of guys, right? That were kind of older where this was, you know, could have been their last year and it's a COVID year. So them kind of you know, pushing us and motivating us like this is it, right? Like this is, it goes by fast. This is our last year. And kind of having that in the back of our minds really kind of helped us as a freshman class. I feel like want to be there and play for them at the time. And looking back on it, I mean, that game, that province game was tough. It was weird every week, kind of, you never really knew what was going to happen, what the outcomes were, the games were going to be, or who you were playing, who was going to be in, who was going to be out. It was always wild. And, you know, playing at the Fridas too with very minimal fan bases there kind of walking out of the same tunnel. It was, it was kind of weird. And, you know, losing that first playoff game, I think was a little bit of a gut check for us about hockey East. Cause I think we were making strides as a program, 
but we didn't quite have that next step, right? We didn't make it to the next level in the playoffs ever. It was always one and done before that. So I think, you know, after that season as a freshman class, anyways, I remember, uh, you know, talking to the guys like, like this is playoffs are a different animal in this league. Okay. And they're like, yeah, absolutely. Now we know. Right. So it was a great learning point for us. Yeah. I remember talking to Artem Schlain after that province game. He said it was unfortunate the way it was because you guys played province the last game of the season to get home ice. And then yeah. you had to play him again. He said it's so hard to beat a team two times in a row. So he said it was yeah. a little bit unfortunate how it worked out, but he said that that game really motivated you guys to sort of know what it's like to play in the playoffs, especially for your class with Twerveberg, yourself, him, obviously, at the time. And I, was, I just thought it was a pretty interesting perspective when I remember him telling me that. Yeah, no, Artie's 100% right there. It's so hard to win twice in a row. And, you know, we actually spanked them the week before too, right? So they definitely came in with a little bit more jam, um, just having from remember that week before too. Yeah, Zach Robbins, one of the most underrated UConn players of all time. Shout out to him. Doesn't get enough love. And I heard Kale Howarth is the funniest hockey player of all time. I'm assuming you would agree with on that. Yeah, no, I love Kale. He's one of my he was one of my better friends. He helped me so much that freshman year, kind of showing me the ropes. And uh yeah, he's one of the funniest hockey players of all time. Yeah, shout out Zach Robbins, so underrated. So fun. I had a lot of fun playing with him and Regali for the first couple of games of that freshman year. Those guys are two great guys and great hockey players that both don't get enough love either. Now, during your sophomore year, your team went on a run to the TD Garden and made it to the Hockey's Championship. Uh, talk about that run, specifically the games against BU and Northeastern, because as a fan, those are probably the best UConn games I've ever been to. But it seemed like you guys were so dialed in and having so much fun playing those games. Um, I just want to ask your perspective on those two games and sort of what it meant to yourself and the program. Yeah, I think... You know, the reason why we had success in those games is because it meant everything to us. You know, we had such an old team that year with guys who have been around and just never got over that hump. And I think at that point they looked around and said, wow, like now we have the supporting cast, right? Like for, you know, to have such strong depth the year that we put, that we did make that run, it was like, okay, we can do it this year. And I think that sense of confidence mixed with desperation at the same time just allowed us to go out and play at our best consistently for throughout that playoff run. And obviously, you know, those two wins, the first one was huge. And then, you know, the second one, I think that year we kind of had Northeastern's number having an old team that played a really defensive style matched up really well against, you know, their kind of run and gun young offensive team at the time. And even though they had Devin Levi, we knew that was going to be our biggest challenge was getting it by him. And, you know, he had our number a few times, during that year, I remember having some huge shot totals against him where we just couldn't get it by him. So I think once we kind of cracked him, it was like, okay, yeah. now we can take these guys and go two in a row here. Yeah. 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 Especially since I know you, I don't know if you can say it, but I feel like you guys got screwed over that game when Carter had the goalie interference. And yeah, that's uh, I feel like you guys got screwed over a little bit in that game. So it's definitely a good revenge moment for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That one, that one's a weird one. Still. I still think about that goal <laughs> interference one. And I just, that one doesn't make, that one quite doesn't make sense to me. But I think they apologized to Cav after it. Cause I think they messed up if I'm not mistaken. Really? I remember him saying yeah, it. I'm not going to remember show. exactly, but we got, I know we got the last laugh that season, so I'm not going to complain about it. 